Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get to our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. We'd greatly appreciate it. We have Melissa Lindstrom on the podcast. She's coming to us all the way from Pittsburgh. She's a nationally ranked top five bikini competitor. She got fifth place at the 2018 North Americans, which is imp- unbelievably impressive. She's also a five-time bikini champ, and she's also a two-time bikini pro. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Melissa, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired you to make that change and adapt that healthy and fit lifestyle? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a mom. I have three kids and my little two are about 15 months apart. So I kind of had back to back babies um, and I started doing I don't know if you've ever heard of the couch to 5k program. I started doing that as a way just to lose baby weight. Um, So then I, as a person, once I start something, I go like full out, like, you know what I mean? So I started, okay, well, I'm kind of jogging. I'm going to start running. So then I did a 5k. Well, I did a 5k. Why not do a 10k? Why not do a half marathon? So I saw I lost a lot of the weight, really enjoyed running. And then I kind of got tired of it. Um, and I didn't like the way my, my body was, it was kind of skinny fat. So I was like, all right, so we'll, we'll try some weights. We'll join a gym. Um, And then it just kind of spiraled from there. I started, you know, lifting and then I liked, I liked it so much. I liked the results I was getting. Someone mentioned you should do a show and I'm like, get out of here. I have three kids, like get out of here. But it always stayed in the back of my mind. So I finally was like, why not? We'll put it on the bucket list. And I never expected it kind of took off once I did that first show. That, and that's awesome because everyone always yeah. has that different story. You know, just going from running to, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if I ran, you know, I've had people on here that are marathon runners and I was like, okay, I don't know what sort of mental illness you have that makes you want to run 26.6 right. and a, 0.6 miles. I had an ex-girlfriend right. who used to do that too, where I was just like, what? I was like, why? She'd be like, oh yeah, I'm going on an eight mile run today. And I was like, like, why? Like, what's the point? Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'm one of those people where after about 20 minutes of running, I'm just like, I'm bored. Like what? Like, yeah. I mean, if someone, unless someone's like chasing me or anything like that, you know, I'm not entertained by running. So yeah, yeah. If you're like a few miles with someone's chasing me. I mean, I'll just let them get me. At that oh, point. oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But that's like the only time when running would actually like ben- benefit me. But yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I completely understand that. But I always love to say, you know, if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there is a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, what exercises yeah. they do, how many reps they do. There are so many little things that add up to, to get the overall overall package that people end up seeing was that a struggle for you starting out to sort of realize what worked best for your body because I always love to say you know if you were to walk up to someone and say wow that body part of yours looks amazing what did you do to get that body part to look the way that it looks 99% of the time what worked best for them it's not going to work as good for you exactly exactly yeah there was a huge learning curve um and obviously with the internet there's so much information out there and so many conflicting accounts of you know what's the best thing i was very lucky i started just tracking my calories so i did a very basic you know um burning more calories than i was taking in and that worked there but then it was kind of i started to learn more about macros and nutrients and the breakdown that you need for the certain goals you have so it's all been it's very fascinating to me you know i would i mean i'd lay on my phone at night and like scroll and read stuff and you know it's just it's, the human body is amazing. It's really cool just to learn more about it as you go on. Well, absolutely. And I always like to sort of compare it to, you know, like being a mad scientist where you're just making basically, yeah. you're just, it's just a lot of trial and error where you're just trying to find yeah. out what works best for you. And it can be such a time process, which is one of the negative things, because I always say like, with, especially with my generation where everyone wants it now and they want it yesterday, where, I mean, you know, if you don't get results automatically, it's it's not really worth it. So right. yeah, it's, it's really hard, but I always say, you know, just stick into it. And eventually when you start to see, just those beginner gains or any change at all it can be just so addictive but now I always I mean because everyone's genetics are so different I always love to ask this question so when you were getting started with working out what was one body part that really took off that you didn't need to train as much and what is one body part that really sort of lagged behind that you had to train into overdrive to get to catch up I'll give my examples first so for me my back train it once a month and it just looks Uh good I have no idea why but I'm also 6'3 so my legs and my lower body are just shot where I mean I Twice a week doesn't really matter, but yeah, yeah. so it, it's definitely a struggle for me. But what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? So I think the one that surprised me the most was abs. Mm-hmm. I have like I've gotten very lucky, I guess, with my ab definition. Um, I've never trained my abs. I've never had ab days, any right? 
and I've had three C-sections. Um, so it's kind of crazy. Cause I remember my doctor, even after my second or third baby was like, you'll, you'll never have abs, just give it up. And well, she was wrong. Um, I credit that to a lot of smart training, heavy lifting, you know, you brace yourself with your core. So that one kind of surprised me. Um, something that I'll probably never be happy with are my legs. I always feel like my legs are too big. Um, I think my parents used to call me kielbasa legs when I was little. So I feel like that just kind of carried with me my entire life. Um, and now, of course, when I look back at like stage pictures, I'm like, uh, they weren't big at all. But I always feel like they're too big. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can completely understand. My number one pet peeve is those people with those naturally genetically blessed calves. That I mean, it's yeah. like, that's the one thing that that's the one body part where I mean, no matter how much you I mean, like I said, I could inject pure muscle into my calves and do 10,000 calf raises every day and they wouldn't grow. I mean, it's just, right. it's just one of right. those freaky things that yeah, I, I honestly just I, I hate. I mean, when you said that you don't even train abs, I was like, you got to you from now on, you need to wake up every morning and just pray to whatever higher power and thank them that you know that you were blessed with those genetics because people would yeah. kill to have those type of genetics. But yeah, well, I mean, weird like before I had kids I never had like a six pack or an eight pack so it really is just lifting yeah I mean I couldn't agree more but I always like to say you know if you were to poll the general public there'd be a small singular percentage of people that would basically have the courage to go up on stage and pose in a bikini in front of people I mean it's something that takes a lot of courage a lot of drive a lot of determination was that a struggle for you starting out sort of finding that courage and motivation to do it or was it like some of the guests that we've had on where they just say you know it got to a certain point where I was just like I'm just gonna go on there and show it off yeah, I mean, it was a combination. I think it was a very, very big eye opener when my first show, I rented my suit and it came in the mail and I like pulled it out. And it was like this big and I was like, oh, what am I doing here? But I was so proud of how I had looked and I put it on and I was like, well, that's actually not too bad, you know? Um, and then when I got back to stage show day, I was just so so excited all that hard work that was the culmination so it, it honestly didn't really phase me everybody's back there you know in, in very little clothing um so it was just it didn't really bother me that day but there was definitely some apprehension leading up to it oh yeah i mean i i, I can totally believe that but i always love to ask as well i mean especially with prep a lot of people i mean i tell them just to be able to get into shape to go into a prep takes so much hard work and dedication but then going into a prep just really is notching things up to an extreme level when it comes to, I mean, you got to get all of your workouts in. you got to eat the right amount of food at the right amount of time. What was that adjustment like for you, the, doing that for the first time, just sort of realizing that prep life is just so strict in every aspect? It was. The first time, I think I was actually very lucky. I was a stay-at-home mom at that time, um, and I believe all my kids were in school. They had just, like, started school, so I was very, very thankful. I had, you know, I could go do my cardio after I took them to school. I could train. You know, I could get all my meals, and I think I was even taking a nap at that point. So the first time wasn't too bad, except for, like, in the evenings when you're like, I am starving. Like that part was hard, but you know, it's just part of the process and you kind of have to get through it. The last couple preps, when I started working full time and my kids were crazy busy and I had an hour commute to work, that's where it started to get a little tricky. Yeah. I, I also have an hour commute to work and I don't, but I don't have any kids, but yeah, I can just imagine if I had extra kids, if I had kids added on to that, you know, it would make my life so much harder and people just don't realize that it is just such a time commitment what you're doing I mean, everything has to be prepped ahead of time i mean it's so it, that's another reason why when i look at most of these bodybuilders i have on the show i mean it's just so inspiring that they're able to do it because we've had we've had probably about like you know like 20 moms on the show and just hearing how they're able to do that is so inspiring would you have any tips for any moms out there who might just even just want to get into shape on how they yeah. can do that because you know we've heard so many times about mom guilt that happens where you just you feel guilty mm -hmm. if you spend time away from your kids what are some ways that you recommend for people that to first of all, deal with mom guilt. And then second of all, just to find that time in general to go out and work out. Yeah. So, um, a couple things. The first thing I think is it's like the, the airplane analogy. And I don't know if you've ever heard this, yep. but if you don't put your oxygen mask on first, you're no good to anyone mm -hmm. around you. So, um, you know, I've had posing clients when I was a personal trainer, I've had clients who were moms who were like, Oh, I don't know if I can make it. No, like your kids deserve a healthy mom. You were a person before you had them. Let them see that you're your own person and show them 
what self-care is. So they grow up and do the same thing and realize how valuable it is. Um, also, like you deserve it. They're, your kids, I mean, deserve a healthy mom. They deserve a mom that's, you know, teaching them healthy habits, showing them a healthy example, and that's going to be around. So if you look at it from that, you know, viewpoint as opposed to a selfish viewpoint, I think it's it's very, very beneficial. Um, as far as time saver, like, honestly, this sport is planning. You have to plan everything. You have to plan what you're eating when. You have to have that food ready. I mean, I have gone through so many preps where um, it was my son's birthday. It was my birthday. It was holidays, and I took my food to Chuck E. Cheese. I baked a cake and didn't have a slice of it. Um, what's that like? Um, and so it's just, it's always thinking ahead, basically. Um, and getting all your workouts in, again, planning, you have to plan. I'm not going to lie. There were preps that I got up at four in the morning and went to the gym for four 30 to get my cardio in that I would come home, shower, get my kids up and ready, do that whole thing, go to work, stop at the gym on the way home to lift, come home, do the mom thing. And then I would be up until, you know, 1130 midnight prepping my food. Um, but where there's a will, there's a way. So yeah, I always find that funny because I work nights. So sometimes, you know, I usually get home around like two o'clock and sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm asleep by four and some of these people are getting up by the time I'm going to bed. I always just find yeah. that. I always just find that so fascinating, but yeah, it, like you said, it, sleep is one of those things that you sometimes have to sacrifice. But you know, oddly enough, I had the number one sleep specials on the planet uh, come on he came to me all the way from oxford and first of all he had one of those british accents where just talking to him you felt like you gained like 10 iq points just because he had he had <laughs> were, were, i was just like okay just talk the entire podcast i'm not going to ask any questions you can just share yeah. your life story i'm not gonna say anything i just want to listen to you speak but yeah he was awesome but that's sleep is one of those things that is not brought up enough i don't think just even on Instagram or on anything because it is the most important thing for recovery. I mean, if you don't get enough sleep, it really does suffer. What is your ideal amount of sleep that you would love to get? And what do you tell your clients who are working out? Because for, I mean, one of the misconceptions that people, a lot of people don't realize that when you are working out and getting into shape, you are going to need to get more sleep than you had before you didn't work out just to get that a time to recover. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes after a really big workout, like it, it's just a level of exhaustion that you don't ever feel any other day. Um, so it, it just shows you how much you need that sleep. Um, I'm very weird. Like I can generally function on about four hours. Um, yeah, which is pretty much the only way I can do that. Is that optimal for muscle recovery? Probably not. <laughs> no. Um, but it has worked. If I had my way though, I would get about, you know, at least six to eight hours, which I actually do, um, this time around this off season, this prep, I'm going to make that more of a priority. I'm actually able, I have a, a cardio machine in my house now, so I don't have to drive to the gym. So I've, you know, made some accommodations where um, I don't have to get up that early, thank God, again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely one of those things where the sleep is so important and, you know, if you can't get enough sleep, just find those times in the day to get some little naps in there too. I mean, that's one yeah. thing that I, that I definitely have to say, but what was your main motivation into competing in bodybuilding? Because I mean, a lot of people, they always, you know, they, they might see bodybuilding first and they might be like, Oh yeah, I, I'd never do that. But then after a while, you know, after enough people walk up to him in the gym and say like, Hey, you should really compete. They just finally say like, Hey, I'll give this a shot. And then they do it and they love it. What was your story like with that? What really convinced you to get on stage? Um, it was, you know, there was a lot of encouragement from people that were, um, you know, kind of in the industry and not bodybuilding so much as just like fitness. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, it was more of like a bucket list thing. Like I drive a minivan, I have three kids. Why the hell not? Like, we'll just throw on a sparkly bikini and go see what happens. I wasn't expecting to love it the way I did. I, I mean, it was honestly pivotal the moment I stepped on stage. It was like, I found my passion right there. And then once you have that experience, and my first show was insane. I mean, um, I, li I literally took everything. I took novice, novice overall, my open class, and then the overall there too. So that was mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I, I'm, I love this. I have to do this again, you know? So, I mean, it was just, it was kind of a bucket list thing. And then it was like, huh. This is something I really love. So once you find that, you kind of got to keep going with it. 
well, I mean, that's my number one point that I love to make in this podcast is just find that one thing in your life that you enjoy so intensely like that and yeah. just keep going with it because, I mean, life's so short. You find that one thing and you keep going, and, I mean, that's that's one of the keys to happiness. But, I mean, I love to ask personally myself because, as you can see, I'm one of the palest people you'll ever meet in your entire life. I mean, the sun <laughs> reflects off of me, and it's not like one of those, like, sexy vampire Twilight-ish things. It's, it's not exactly. like that, okay? It's one of those things where people are like, oh, my God, that's that's really white. But, yeah, so I always love to ask because I've never been tan a day in my life. I get a farmer's tan, which, let's face it, is not a real tan. Or I just get burnt to an absolute crisp. So what is that like for you when you put that tan on? Because everyone always talks about, you know, like you see muscles that you never even knew that you had. Everything really seems to pop yeah. out. What is that experience like for you? Well, the first time, it's like terrifying. Totally, yeah. yeah, it's terrifying because you're naked. And I never – like, that is the one thing I never realized when I started this podcast. And when I found that out, I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. But yeah, yeah, that's definitely, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, um, it's cold. It's so cold, too. This spray tan is so freaking cold. And then you have to stand there with um, fans on you to dry. Which So you're standing there just, like, naked, like, so vulnerable and cold. And it's not, you're like, what am I doing? Um, but it is very cool because it gets darker. You get more coats on, like, the next morning and stuff like that. And it's just... Man, I mean, you look silly to the average person, but on stage, it just pulls everything out. And pro tan has a very distinct smell. Like, you can walk in, like, a hotel if there's a show going on and, like, smell it. You're like, okay, there's pro tan around here somewhere, <laughs> so... Yeah, that's awesome. And I always got to say, you know, like you also have to be like a statue, though. You can't really move. You can't sit on anything. You can't touch anything. So, yeah, that's that's one of the drawbacks. But again, it just shows what these athletes have to go through when they're competing in their shows. But the most surprising thing by far for me that I ever learned from doing this podcast is, I mean, if if like I said, again, if you're to pull the general public, you would never I don't think that many people would ever guess this. But for a lot of these athletes that we have on posing is the hardest thing for them. It's harder than they're working out. It's harder than the nutrition. I mean, it's something that the general public would never guess. I don't think would be the hardest thing, but it is. I mean, I always like to compare it, though, to you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always something that's ever evolving. What is your experience? With, what is your experience with posing been like? Was it difficult for you at first? And have you sort of been able to make it easier for yourself? Or is is it something that you've always struggled with and you just continue to work on? Um, a little of both. I mean, when I started, I, I mean, you know, the heel, the five inch clear heel. And I mean, I seriously felt like I looked like Bambi on ice. The first time I put them on, I was clomping around. I didn't know, like, I'm going to make this look sexy. Like, are you kidding? <laughs> um, so it was practice. I would walk, wear them around my house, you know what I mean? Just so I got comfortable. So I would, you know, get the movements where my legs were fully extended, all of that. Um, so it was a matter of getting comfortable. And then um, it, it honestly is practice. I would go and I would work out um, and then I would pose for 45 minutes afterwards um, or nights. You know, I'd put my kids to bed and I would go to the gym in the room where like no one was with the mirrors and, and practice posing. Um, that's one thing you're absolutely correct. It is so important. Like get a good posing coach. Like it is huge because they they know what the judges are looking for. They see you from the angle that a judge is going to see you. And as opposed to us, we see ourselves straight on. We can't see ourselves from down, you know, where judges sit. So um, it, it's very important. And then just practice. Trust them and practice. Uh, and I mean, I cannot say enough also just what she was saying, getting a posing coach. We've had so many people come on and talk about, you know, like my first show, I, I started posing like two weeks before my first show or whatever yeah. like that. And it's like, oh, well, good luck with that. I mean, we've had we had one person who was just such a genetic freak where they went on stage and they won, even though they had never done posing before. But I was like, OK, you know, I need to see some of your contest photos. And he showed me his and I was like, yeah, OK, you're just a you're just a freak like that, where yeah. it's just like you can go on. But yeah, I mean, but I always love to say, though, too, that guy was the one lucky guy. But if you were to be even the most in shape person on the planet and you didn't know how to pose, you're not going to win. It's because, I mean, no, it's, yeah. no one's going to see what your best mm -hmm. angles. They're not going to see it. Absolutely. And you also need to know, like, um, how to, how, what your best angles are and mm -hmm. how to get yourself in that position because during comparison rounds, they're moving you around. You're not just going to one place and staying, yep. you know? So you have to be very aware of who is seeing what and how to make it look awesome, basically. And what made you want to become a posing coach? Was it just that you always wanted to help out others or what really got you into that process? Uh, I love posing. I think it is just, I mean, it is, it is the cherry on top. If you go out there and you can get those judges eyes on you, um, 
that's what you want, basically. You want them looking at you, unable to look away from you. And how do you do that? You can't go out there and just hit a pose and not do anything. You have to have something that draws their eyes to you. And there's so many little nuances and ways you can do that um, that I love being able to help other people with that. Like, it, it just it pulls all their hard work together. It's just, you know, like I said, the cherry on top of, of a really hard, <laughs> hard cake to bake, basically. Yep. And what would you say being a posing coach is the hardest pose to teach your female clients? What is the hardest one that the, that you think women on in general, just for bikini that they struggle with the most? I mean, I don't know. I think it fluctuates. I think the back pose is always a little awkward. Let's be honest. Um, you know, I've had family members come to my shows and, and my brother was like, oh, God, like my when eyes. you did that, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. So I think there's also, um, and you can't see your back as much. So you don't know really what it looks like. Um, and you have to, you know, toe the line between being attractive and sexy and just classless. You want to keep it classy. Too, that, so. that, I mean, that's what I always say makes it so much more difficult for the women than for the men. Cause the men, I mean, they just go out there and they, they just pose. I mean, it's like, yeah. a, it's like an open highway for them. But I, I say the one positive though, about the back pose though, is that you don't have to have that smile on. You don't have to pretend like you're, oh, you don't have to pretend because uh, we've heard that is the one thing that is probably the hardest for a lot of people is just having that smile and not just grunting or not just grinning or grinding your teeth up basically, because I mean, you're basically, you're flexing everything. You still got to make it look like everything's fine and dandy, which yeah. So, so that's definitely you can also get your stomach out a little bit, yeah. which is nice. You can kind of take some deep breaths. Yeah. Like you don't have to hold it so flat. So yeah. like, okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I always, and you brought it up a little bit earlier, but I always love to ask. Cause I mean, I made a huge mistake a few podcasts back where I asked a girl from the South, if she had ever had any experience in high heels before she competed. And right as soon as I was asking that, I was like, okay, that was a dumb question. She obviously did. And then she was like, y'all, I'm from the South, and I know how to wear – so I was like, okay, I apologize. I should have known ahead of time. I, I was like, yeah, she's from Texas. So I was like, okay. But being from the North, and we have a lot of Northern people on as well that don't really have that much experience in heels, was that a struggle for you sort of learning how to do your routine in heels? Because doing your routine without heels on is hard enough as it is, but with heels, I mean, that just adds it. Yeah, it is. Um and that's why I just said, like, I had to practice so much just, like, living life in them, you know, just getting comfortable with them. And I will tell you, like, every time I have them on in practice, um, every single time I take them off, I'm like, oh, God, like, every single time still. Um, and they're, I mean, I don't know if other women have told you this, but the day after a show, when you're out there and you're posing, especially if you're out there for call outs and comparisons for a lot, um, I am so sore the next yeah. day because posing, I mean, you have to hold it tight. You have to be still, but you have to hold it. You know what I mean? Your mm -hmm. breath, your conscious of your breathing. And I just, I'm so sore the next day. So yeah, definitely. I'm not a big heel wearer. Mm -hmm. I'm like a flip flop slipper, yeah. like sneaker kind of girl. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely... Yeah eye-opening when I put those on well yeah the amount of times that we've heard people say that as well that I mean like posing for them I mean it's a workout you sweat more than you do when you're working out I mean it's 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 Absolutely. really just I mean a workout in and of itself but I always love to ask this question to all my guests I mean whether they be bands or bodybuilders health and fitness professors or anything so I ask for my bands what is that feeling like when you get to perform live in front of you know all these people and sing your songs what is that feeling like but I feel that also applies to the bodybuilders that I have on what is that feeling like for you when you get to walk up on stage and you know show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months for what is that feeling like for you it's it's just like it's euphoric I mean like I said it's the culmination of everything all those early mornings all those you know meals that you didn't want to eat that you ate all those times that you passed on pizza and had tilapia like it's just like it honestly it feels like that's your moment like that's your moment to shine and you're gonna enjoy it because you freaking earned it like that's it so it's cool it is a little intimidating depending obviously on the show um like when I did North Americans, which was, it was my first national level show. Those lights were insane, like insanely bright. Like I had no idea where my coach was, where my boyfriend was, like where anybody was. I was just like, Oh shit. Like, let's just go do this. So, um, that was a little crazy, but you can't let that freak you out. You just got to enjoy the moment. It's pretty awesome. I, I had, so I never did a show or anything, but I have a similar experience. And I've shared this story a couple of times, but I, I think it'd be appropriate to share it now again. So, cause it's coming up on the six year anniversary. So when I was a senior in high school, I, we, there's the thing that we do in, at our school called the man pageant, where it's kind of like a beauty pageant, except it's for guys where we make, it's kind of like a make fun of thing like that. We're like, we have like a talent competition. We have like a, a posing competition where you wear like your best beach wear or whatever like that, where it's basically just a guy with a, 
with a towel over his head and then like just wearing a, a trunk. But so for our, our skit that we did for like a, a talent thing, me and my friend, I wasn't in the pageant, but I helped him out because uh, he, he was, he weighed like 280 pounds. Like he was an obese, he was a line, he was a lineman for our high school football team. But so we did, if you know the Chris Farley Chippendale skit, skit from SNL. Yeah. So I was, oh the, I was Patrick Swayze and he was Chris Farley and we redid that whole entire thing. And it was, you know, that was my one moment where I had like, well, I was in, in stage in front of a lot of people. I mean, I was a pitcher in baseball, so I know what that is like, you know, also just being on the mound, but just being on stage, those lights were so bright. I couldn't see anyone in the stands. I couldn't hear anyone laughing because I was so into it. So I thought for a second, I was like, okay, is this not funny? Like, are we just making fools of ourselves? Yeah. But then when I saw the replays and everyone was just cracking up and the girls were just laughing their butts off, then I was like, okay, yeah, it was, it was worth it. But yeah, it so that's, cool. that's my one moment on the stage too, where yeah, like before I was going on, like I was shaking all over and I was like, okay, this has got to be good. And it's like, I mean, I even had to shave my armpits for that. Cause and it was like, and that was, and that's dedication for me right there. That as a, is as dedication. Yeah. You know, so yeah, but yeah, that was, yeah. that was, that was, that, that, that was really, really fun. So yeah, that was one of those moments that, you know, I'll always remember. And that's coming up in like two weeks. It's going to be like the sixth year anniversary. So I'll probably post that on Instagram just to, for my, for my podcast just to be like, okay, this was me six years ago, but yeah, yeah that, that definitely brings back memories. But awesome. Yeah. So I always love to ask, you know, for one of the fun questions that I love to ask for the podcast is what is your go-to post-show meal? Ooh. Do you mean like between prejudging and final? Or e like either way, or it could be at the very end when you just pick out, yeah. Oh god. Um I usually don't just do one meal. Mm -hmm. It's usually like we're gonna stop a few places on the way yeah. home. But um always a burger and fries, like always. And I'll get the cheese on it, I'll get like the white bun, I'll do that, all that. Um and then pizza. Definitely pizza. And then I have to have some sort of dessert, whether it's like cupcakes or like um, danishes, something like that. Um, in North Americans, I actually went back to the room. My friends had brought me cupcakes. I ate two of them, and we were going across the street for pizza and wings. And I took a bag of M&Ms with me to walk across the street yeah. to eat. So it's kind of just a little bit of everything. I, I always said if I ever competed, I would just rent out a Five Guys for the night, and i just tell them, you're making me enough food. Uh, the only time I'm going to stop is if I either pass out, I choke to death, or or I just explode. That's the only way that we're going to yeah. stop. I'm just going to say for the whole night, just keep feeding me. I don't care if I throw up or anything. I'm going to keep going. But so, yeah, exactly. that's that's what I would do. But that also leads me into, I think, the most important question that I ask in this podcast because, I mean, I ask it to everyone, and it's one of those things that isn't talked about enough on Instagram, I don't think. And it, it's I like to give an example. So I was at a party, a New Year's Eve party, and one of my friends came up to me and said, you know, hey, Ryan, I love watching the podcast. One of the things that I was surprised to know about these competitors because, you know, you just see their photos of when they're competing is that that look is not sustainable. You're not going to be able to look like that 365 days out of the year. I think when I talk to the average people that, I, you know, I just talk to on the street or just, you know, friends that watch the show, they just say, you know, that is fascinating because a lot of the times the public thinks that, you know, you, you're able to look yeah. like that 365 days a year. Now, mostly is that's because, you know, on Instagram, a lot of people just post, you know, what they look like during the show year round they do that but another thing too is that it's just it, for a lot of people they just aren't able to fathom that all of that hard work is a, is a look that's not sustainable was that a struggle for you when you were getting started just sort of realizing that that you know like hey i've worked my butt off for these months upon months i put my body through basically a living hell to get to this final right. look and that i am not going to be able to maintain this look was that a struggle for you and how is that yeah. has it changed at all over time because we have so many guests that come on and talk about you know how they get anxious or they get depressed yeah. has that been a has that been a struggle for you and how have you sort of adapted to that over time yeah, um, absolutely. Because it's, it's kind of like you see your body get to this point and you're like, okay, well, I got it to this point. So it's able to do it. So I should be able to keep it like that. Um, but it, it's not healthy. I mean, you will wreck everything in your body doing that. So um, it, it's a huge, I mean, I don't want to swear, but it's like a mind fuck. It really is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and seeing lines disappear and you get softer. So I think honestly, I do still struggle with it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've only been competing since 2016. So this is, you know, still fairly new for me, but um, it's getting easier to deal with as I, as seasons go on, because I know even, you know, as I'm softer now and I'm not seeing the lines and things like that, I I've always been able to get back to it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, what's amazing is what you see, what you've done underneath all of that in the off season while you're working. So it's kind of like you, you have to think of it like a Christmas present. You know what I mean? It's sitting there under the tree. You can't open it till Christmas day. Um, and just honestly, just trust the process. I mean, I know it sounds cliched, but you really have to, because 
if you try to live like that, you're going to wreck your health. You're going to have no longevity in the sport and it's just going to, it's not worth it Mm -hmm. at all. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I, I mean, that's why I just love asking that question, because like I said, it is not talked about. I don't think so much that a lot of people do struggle with that. But also you need to get a coach when you're competing, because I've had people that didn't have a coach and then they, they freak out because they didn't know that like you're, you're going to put on weight afterwards. They're like, oh, I thought I could just look like this forever. But yeah, it's so it's definitely one of those struggles. But now I always love to ask these two questions that all of my health and fitness guests. So for the first question, one of the things that I discovered when I was you know working out and going to the gym a lot in college and getting bigger and stronger, there's so many positive. But one of the negative things for me is that you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars. I mean, I'm still home yeah. with my parents for the next few months before I move out. And every time they come home with groceries, I basically have to lift the entire car and the groceries into the into the house right. from the garage. Has that been a similar experience with you when, I mean, even when you're out and about where people just look at you or friends they, and they just assume that you can do favors like that for them? Um. Yes and no. I mean, a lot of it's kind of like, I'm, I'm a small, I'm almost five two, so I'm little. So I don't feel like people do that. But it's more like, oh look at your guns mm-hmm. and like I'm over here muscles and yep. you know, stuff like that. Um I I think probably guys get that a lot more. I than still women. remember to this day being at the bar and having girls always come up and feel my arms without even asking. They just come up and be like, Oh my God, let, Becky, look at this, look at these and I'd be like, Oh okay, that's my arm. Thanks. I mean yeah, I was vain yeah. back then so I was like, Okay, yeah, you know, I'll pump it up a little bit for you. But yeah, but yeah, other than that, you know other than that, you know, it was just it was just weirder. Like sometimes like grandmas would just be like, Oh, look at that and they just like come up and they'd be like, Oh, can you help me lift all this stuff for my groceries? And I'd be like yeah, yeah. And well and I used yeah. to work at Amazon before I worked at UPS and they, they that's what they nicknamed me they said muscles and every time there's a heavy package they say you know get muscles over here to come and do it so right. yeah I, I totally right. yeah I totally understand that and for me it's also a double-edged sword being 6'3 because even if I didn't have any muscle at all they just say oh tall guy can do it you're so, big yeah, yeah exactly so yeah it's a dub and it just got to a point where I mean like last summer every other weekend a friend would text text me or call me and just say hey you know I'll take you out for dinner afterwards or whatever but you want to help me move or it's got to a point where I said hey as long as you let me get my workout in before because I do not want to get tired enough moving your crappy furniture that I won't have to be able to work out. So yeah, I, I definitely had to do that. But now probably my favorite question to ask, and again, a multi-million dollar idea for anyone out there listening. But when it comes to clothes for fit women, I mean, I always like to say fit men have their own oh. problems, but fit women have their own. I always love to say, I mean, especially with if you have big shoulders, dresses aren't your best friend. Jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time oh, because you have to have, terrible. well, all these comparators have big, strong lower bodies and small waists and jeans are not made mm-hmm. for that. So what are some yeah. ways that you sort of compensate for the fact that your clothing options are severely limited? They are. Um and that's frustrating. That is so frustrating. Yep. But God bless the fact that leggings are like a thing. Yep. Um, we can do a lot of leggings, which is nice. Um, and the long sweaters, the jeans are so frustrating because we want, you know, the muscular legs, we want the big glutes, we want the tiny waist. And like, that is not how jeans are made at all. Um, the shoulder situation, I actually, it's funny you say that I actually ripped my winter coat. Uh, all the shoulder seams front and back went so I had to borrow one of my daughters so now I'm wearing that coat um so it kind of I mean you kind of just roll with it I guess I do a lot of leggings do a lot of hoodies Mm -hmm. and just you know bigger sweaters stuff like that yeah and well I mean yeah and I always say that I always give the example I came home one time from uh for after my freshman year of college and I put on you know about 15 pounds of muscle and I went to a friend's wedding and I bend down I heard a now, luckily, uh, it was the shirt inside the suit. Luckily, it wasn't the suit, so I lucked out on that one. But that's when I realized, you know, like, hey, I might need to change my wardrobe and might need to upgrade it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And but, you don't want to have, like, too many clothes. Mm-hmm. Like, you definitely need, like, prep clothes, and you need, like, post-show clothes, and then you need, like, deep in the off-season clothes. But it's, like, such a pain to have to keep yeah. buying stuff. So you kind of, like, try to squeeze into those other ones. And it's, like, it's Yeah, I mean, cool. I, I don't even compete, but I still have two seasons of clothes just because, like, when you're up in Minnesota and it gets to the, like, negative 30 degrees like it did on Wednesday, you know, you, you're you going to need to put on some weight. Like, I usually put on about, like, 10 to 15 pounds during the winter just to survive because if I was as lean as I get during the summer, you know, you're going to freeze to death out there walking yeah. out there. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things where if people could just make clothes that, like, readjusted themselves, kind of like the back to the future thing where the clothing dries itself, where you could just make a yeah. clothes that, like, got a little bit long. Yeah, that would be my go to so anyone out there if you're thinking about inventing that you know I, i'll give you the patent i can't i gave you the idea right here but you can go ahead and do with it what you want but now i I always love to ask you know the moms and the dads that i have on the show so what has your kids reaction been like to having you know a mom that is in better shape than a lot of all the other moms that they have or friends with because a lot of times especially for the female bodybuilders i mean it's not such a common thing that sometimes the kids reactions can be you know a little like a little different yeah um 
You know, I don't know. I, my oldest is a teenager. Okay. She's in high school. Oh, great. Um, yep. Yeah. So I'm I'm always very conscious of what I post online. Um, I was gonna say, yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Instagram. You know, they it. You know, nudity sells, obviously, but I never want my kids to Google me and see a picture of my rear end that's not me on stage. I never want that to happen. Yep. So um, I'm always very conscious of that. Like I'm their mom before anything. That's the most important thing to me. Um, I think they're proud of me. Yeah. I mean, it's cute when you hear them say stuff. Like my little one will be like, oh, look at that bicep. I think I see a vein, <laughs> like stuff like that. Or, yeah. or they know, like, oh, this has a lot of protein in it, you know? And um, one thing that was really cool, you know, is I see my, my daughter, my oldest, mm -hmm. um, reposting stuff. Like when I do shows, like yeah. that she's proud of me or, yeah. you know, like it, it's, it's just cool. Like I want to make them proud. That's my whole motivation is I want them to know it's never too late to do anything. If mm -hmm. you had told me 10 years ago that this is what I would be doing and doing well at it, I would have been like, you're not, that yeah. will never happen. But I found something I love and I want them to know like no matter what anyone says you can always do it always. Well and I got to say you have one of the lucky teenagers and cuz some of the moms that we have on or dads that have the teenagers too they just get berated cuz their friends are always like oh dude your mom or dad is ripped or whatever like they're a bodybuilder and that's like a thing where then they they get yeah. sick of it cuz they're like oh my god just enough of that already. But yeah, it's always yeah. nice to have and probably the biggest benefit that I love to say especially for people that have fit parents is that I had a health specialist come on and you know talk about the obesity crisis and he said, right. you know, one of the biggest things to help help curb this is to, you know, your, your parents got to practice and, and they got to give you the lifestyle because that is, he said, that's the number one thing that helps promote, you know, a curb to the obesity crisis is the parents that have those healthy lifestyles because then the kids look at that and they realize that, you know, they can do that. And then they just sort of, you know, subconsciously pick that up because if you force the kids to do it, then, then they won't normally do it. But if you just, you know, lay it out there and say like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Eventually they'll be interested in it. And that is the number one thing. So again, you know, parents, I mean, doing that, that's the, I mean, that is a key to really do that. So yeah, just portraying that healthy and fitness lifestyle too, is just so important, especially with the next generation of what's going on. And I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree yeah. with you more on that, but now we go to our audience favorite, my personal favorite part of the podcast, a little questionnaire where we're going to ask Melissa here about a dozen or so health and fitness questions that we ask all of our guests, sort of a getting to know you. So for our first question, what is your go-to workout song at the moment? So I always feel like I have like one theme, a song for prep. So I feel like the next one is The Edge of Glory by Lady Gaga. Right. I feel like, you know, that that's it for some reason. That one speaks to me. But I also like Oceans to Oceans, which was an Aquaman. It's like a re it's like a funky remix of Africa by Toto. And um, I love Africa. Yep. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's definitely – yeah, that's a great one. I mean I'm also a sucker for the cheesy 80s music. I mean I'll have, you know, like the Rocky Four soundtrack on, which is the cheesiest soundtrack of all time. But, yeah, I mean I have a problem. So I have a gym at home, which I can work out at. So like 75% of the time I work out there. But when I go to a normal gym, I got to wait for the beat to drop before I do a workout. So like if I'm doing like lat pull downs, I sometimes am standing there for like 30 seconds. And I've had people come up to me and be like, hey, are you all right? Did you like pull out a muscle or something like that? And I'm like, nope, just waiting for the beat to drop. So, yeah, I am known throughout my yeah. gym as the guy that waits for the beat to drop. But, you know, hey, <laughs> hey, I'll take it. But now out of all the celebrities on the planet, if you could work out with any celebrity, who would it be? Oh, that's a good one. I could work out with any male or female. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Um, oh, shit. Who would I work out with? <laughs> now, um, that's a really good question. I would say, I mean, I always loved Nicole Wilkins. I always thought oh, she was super badass. Mm -hmm. um, I would say her. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, I think that's like the, you're going to be like a close to our hundredth health and fitness guys. And yeah, that's, that's been the answer about four or five times. So yeah, she's, she's up there, but I mean, thank you for not saying the rock. The rock has been our answer like 90% of the time. I mean, but he's the rock. So I, I completely, it almost got to a point where I wanted to say other than Dwayne, the rock Johnson, if you could work out with any other celebrity, but yeah, I totally understand for me, it would be like Arnold, but just because it's Arnold and I'd love to hear him yell at me in his Austrian accent. I think that'd be really, really funny. <laughs> so yeah, I do that all the time. But now, out of all, this, all the celebrities on the planet, if you could train any celebrity, who would it be? Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito. <laughs> wow. I would have oh, never guessed that in a million years. Yeah. He needs a trainer. Um, he is so funny, though. I, watching It's Always Sunny, I mean, he is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in that yeah. show. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think I would be really intimidated to train a celebrity, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Um. So I really don't know. It would have to be someone who wasn't like in the industry, because I'd be like, I don't know. You go. You're good. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, I was gonna say like our most popular answer is like Kevin Hart, but with that, I gotta say, you know, if you get a comedian, you're not gonna get a workout in. You're gonna get the best ab workout of all time, but you're not gonna get a workout yeah. in. Yeah. I'll get an ab They're gonna trick. Yeah, they're exactly. gonna trick you by making you laugh the whole time and not like doing stuff for him. But yeah, I Kevin Hart would be a great one for me as well. But now, what is one item that you always need to have in your fridge? Egg whites. Our second most Always popular answer. The most, the most surprising answer for me has been mustard. Never would have guessed that in a million years that oh, some yeah. people have that. I have like three variations of mustard in there. Yeah. That, I but, also have like huge diet pop or diet soda. I don't know what you guys it's call pop it. It's pop in the Midwest. <laughs> it's pop. Yeah, it's yeah, pop for yeah, us. Yeah. So I'm always like – and I don't know, like maybe I shouldn't say this, but even on prep, I drink it. Yeah. So you say soda, you yeah. get, you get kicked out if you say soda where I'm from. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah there you, you don't go. say that in yeah. Pittsburgh yeah. either. It's yeah. Pop. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember one time when I took a trip to the East Coast and I kept saying, you know, to the waiter, I was like, "Can you get me a pop?" And he's like, "A what?" And I was like, "Yeah." What? So yeah, I yeah, yeah. That, it's 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 definitely one of those things. So now, out of all of your followers on Instagram, if they all met you in person, what what would you think would be the most surprising thing they'd find out about you? Um, I really don't know. You know, I feel like I'm very transparent on my social media, my Instagram. I am not someone who puts on a show. Like when stuff sucks, I will say it sucks. If something's hard, I will say it's hard. I think, I don't know, maybe I've heard that people were surprised I was short. Mm -hmm. So maybe like that, that might be it just because, you know, stage shots, they're from the ground up. So you look taller. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've always heard, you know, like, oh, you're a midget. Like, you know, you're shorter <laughs> than I thought. But, um, you know, and, and they are kind of right. I am sort of a midget. Yeah. So, but that's, you know, I, I don't think. Also, I'm just very, very much a homebody. Yeah. You know, I'm not like a, I don't know. I just, I like to be home with my family, my close group, you know, and yeah. I'm just kind of boring. Yeah. Well, no, and I and I'm that same way too. So I mean, I complete. I mean, let's let's face it. We're doing this on a Saturday night, basically. So it's right. you know, if that doesn't prove out. anything, I don't know what is. So yeah, I, I yeah, same here with me, 100. percent But now, if you had the all-knowing power to change anything about the sport of bodybuilding, what is one thing that you would want to see changed? Ooh. Um. I would want there. To be some sort of like mandatory education almost, I guess, for people that are competing because maybe this is more in like bikini, I should say. A lot of girls, you know, oh, I look good in a bikini. And yeah, they do. But for what's required for the sport, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're just not aware of it. Um, also, I feel like, you know, they need to, there has to be education on what to do after a show, you know, health, how important health is it's not all aesthetics it's you know it's mostly aesthetics but there has to be an element of how important the health side is to it so just some sort of education um and knowing how things work you know yeah you go do a small show your first show there's two people in your class you're nationally qualified like that doesn't mean you should step on a national stage you know so just sort of um i don't know even if it's you know a class or a seminar or something you take i just think it would be really really helpful absolutely i mean i couldn't agree more with that and now we go to the fun segment of our questionnaire so what was the last tv show that you binge watched okay currently binge watching punisher, punisher. and then we just finished you i just finished that as well that is mine yep too that was yeah it was good i liked it yeah i liked it too but it's one of those ones where you're like okay well there's only one season now what do i do with my life you well, they're know? working on a second one now too. Yeah. So, but hopefully, you know, it's supposed, the next one's supposed to be set in Los Angeles. I think, I think, I think the guy's going to move on or, or something like that. But I, I was really shocked by the ending. I thought that that thing that happened wasn't going to yeah. happen. So yeah. 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 I didn't see that coming. Yeah. I thought they would drag it on for another season and then have, you know, see, yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was, it was very, very good. But now what's your favorite TV show of all time? Uh, the office. <laughs> You can't go wrong. You just put that on anywhere, any season, any episode. It's it's good. For me, it's a tie between The Office and Friends, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally get it. It's, yeah. it, it, it's like yeah. comfort food. I mean, when it comes on, you know, it's it's guaranteed to make you laugh. It's guaranteed to you know make you feel better. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. But now everyone has one. Was a guilty pleasure movie that you enjoyed? Um, 
16 Candles. I love 16 Candles. And Mean Girls is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> 16 Candles is a great movie. I love that. I love Anthony Michael Hall's character. He's one of it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I I I whenever that's one of those movies where whenever it comes on and I'm not doing anything, you know, I'll watch the whole, I'll watch the whole thing. I'll go through with it. But for me, all my guy friends, you know, close your ears. I'll never admit this in person, but Princess Bride is my is my guilty pleasure movie. You know, I've never seen that. Okay, this day is really starting to make me angry because you're the second podcast and the the last podcast I'm doing today, and both of us both of the guests now have never seen Princess Bride. So that's you know. So if you ever have any free time, I highly, if you ever have any free time, I highly, highly recommend you watch it. It's one of those, one of those really great movies. And I can guarantee you've heard about 15 quotes from it because all the quotes are just so ingrained in pop culture where, yeah, if if you watch it, you'd be like, oh, so that's where that line comes from that people say all the time or that's so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it is really one of the great ones. But now we go to our final two questions of the questionnaire. So what is your favorite fashion trend of all time and least favorite fashion trend of all time? Okay, I love bootcut jeans, and I don't understand why no one will bring them back. They were very good for my short legs because <laughs> they I could wear heels, and they did not drag on the ground because there was enough room to get the boot under there, and I thought they were very flattering. They kind of balanced out the, the quads, um, so I liked bootcut jeans. Least favorite are, like, the high-waisted mom jeans. Like, who thought that was a good idea? They're terrible. My 16-year-old wears them. And like all her friends do, and they can pull them off, but like, no thanks. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, flannel is my go-to just because it gets so cold here, especially during the winter. But my least favorite, my dad ruined it in the late '90s. But women can rock these, but guys can't fanny packs. See, that's the big. I don't think even women can really rock them. I think they're hideous. I just say that because I've heard so many times with guests on my podcast, especially the women, were like, "Oh, but I have a fanny pack," and I was like, "Okay, you didn't hear me finish it where I say women can, but guys, yeah, guys, it is, it is hideous." But I always say, if there's one thing I can accomplish with this podcast, is, is if I could stop the spread of fanny packs because they are making sort of a small comeback. So yeah, get, that's you got, terrible. You got to get rid of fanny packs. But now my last question of the questionnaire: If you could go back in time and talk to the 18 year old version of yourself, what would be the best piece of advice you would give her? Oh, wow. Um, just don't give up. I mean, as bad as stuff seems, um, as unpredictable as your life is going to be, it will be okay. I mean, no matter what. And I wish, I wish everyone knew that because somehow stuff always works out. You know, you learn from it. Sometimes, unfortunately, the hard stuff is what teaches you lessons. So just Stay resilient and and be true to yourself. Because I wasted, I mean, and I think a lot of people waste a lot of their time in their 20s trying to figure out who they are and what, what's good and, and cool. And I'm kind of past that. I'm past that age. And it's so freeing. You're just like, okay, well, you don't like me, tough. You know, yeah. just don't ever compromise on that. Stick to your guns and, you know, stick to Literally what you want and to figuratively. Do. You might, right, Stick exactly. to your guns literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah, and I couldn't agree with you. I mean, I'm 24 right now, so I'm still dealing with that. But yeah, I cannot wait till I get to the age where, you know, finally, you know, all that stuff really clears up. But yeah, I mean, I'm in, like I said, I mean, I'm enjoying doing this. And I think I found something that, that works really well. So again, just find that thing in your life, people. And for our final two questions that I love to ask every guest before I wrap things up. So what is this year looking like for you? Are you going to be competing? Are you are you going to be in a prep soon? Or are you in your, your bulking phase? What are you doing right now? So I'm kind of finishing up my off season. Um, I'm going to start prepping. It's looking like probably February. Um, well, which is this month, probably the end of this month. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look at that. Um, yeah, I know. I'm looking to compete this summer, um, most likely June and July. Um, you know, I will go past that if I need to. Looking at other shows um, in Pittsburgh, national, you know. I was going to say, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is like, Pittsburgh has some of the biggest shows on the planet, so it's lucky that you're right there. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, I'm looking to do junior nationals in Chicago. I've never been to Chicago, so I kind of wanted to go do that. Chicago's um, overrated. Then, I've been there like five times. <laughs> yeah. Is it? it? I mean, it's got great pizza, but other than that, I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, wow, big buildings. Never seen those before. Right, right. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, and then probably universe in new jersey in a couple weeks later um and then we'll kind of reevaluate you know where i am how everything went what we need to tweak if it's good to keep going or you know whatever so i'm starting now to you know i definitely indulge some in the off season because i had so much time i like to take a longer off season my body really benefits from it i just got blood work done everything's kosher 
Um, so we're good to go there. So I'm just starting to slowly clean things up, you know, like maybe my last meal is not like chips and salsa. Mm -hmm. We're going back to egg white, stuff yeah. like that. Um, and then, you know, slowly adding more cardio back in and just starting to prep for prep, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And we wish you nothing but the best in that. And lastly, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? A shout out. Sure. Well, my kids, obviously, yep. they're amazing little human beings. Yep. McKenna, Braxton, and Hadley. Um, my boyfriend, Chris Domenico, he's a bodybuilder too. Um, he's a IFBB pro. He won nationals last year, and he's just always so helpful to me, and you know, gives me so much good insight, and really, you know, helps me see myself or tell me how I look when I can't see myself accurately. Yeah. So um, definitely, just them, my friends and family, always so supportive, even when I'm doing these crazy things that they don't understand, you know, so I just appreciate everyone in my corner. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you guys go and give Melissa a follow down below. I highly, highly recommend it. She also has a YouTube channel that you guys can go and check out. I'll leave a link to that down below as well. Very, very inspiring to have you come on and talk to her. I mean, it's like, it's one of these things where I have some of these moms on and I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. They're in better shape than me sometimes. And it's like, it's like, come on people. This is ridiculous. But yeah, again, <laughs> go and give her a follow looking at just looking at some of her pictures and some of those workouts. You're going to say to yourself, I need to get off the couch and stop eating all these Twinkies and go and you start going to the gym a little bit more. So again, we cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. I mean, you are a great guest, just an absolute delight to talk to. And again, you guys, go and give Melissa a follow, all of her links down below. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing out. Have a great day, everyone.